Hello and welcome. Today, Gabe Bodner interviews Dr. Joanna Zeiger from Canna Research Foundation. Canna Research Foundation is a non-profit organization comprised of an accomplished team of cannabis outcomes researchers. They conduct and consult on studies to understand cannabis patterns of use, benefits, adverse effects, and knowledge and attitudes in populations of medical cannabis users. In this video, we have just the highlights of the interview, but you will find a link to the unedited interview in the description below. Please enjoy. Hello, Joanna. Welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, Joanna is the CEO at Canna Research Group. Do I have that correct? Canna Research Foundation. Canna Research Foundation. Thank you. Um, and I was introduced to Joanna just a few weeks ago. And after talking with Joanna and looking at her bio uh, as just, well, you, you have a, an incredible bio, both as an athlete, now as an author, and as a CEO. I just found what you've done extremely fascinating in your life so far. Um, and I just wanted to take some time today to learn more about you and what you're doing with the Canna Research Foundation. So again, thank you for being here. Sure, my pleasure. I always uh, enjoy giving information, uh, especially educating people about cannabis. Uh, again, you, you've written a book now, you're, you're a professional coach, triathlete, uh, for other triathletes and runners, correct? Yes, yeah, so um, I have a PhD in epidemiology. So yeah. I do uh, research and I uh, particularly cannabis research. And I also am a coach. I have been a coach for over 20 years. I work with endurance athletes mainly triathletes and runners, but I have worked with climbers. I've worked with, um, do a lot of mental skills training. My book is called uh, The Champion Mindset, An Athlete's Guide to Mental Toughness. Um, do I have a copy of it around here? Um, no, but I'll, I'll um, you can link. find it on Amazon. Yeah, and, I'll, I'll uh, put it below. So well. I, through my book, um, I actually, after that, started doing a lot of mental skills coaching with, with athletes from all kinds of sports. So my degree is in genetic epidemiology. So I uh, looked at gene environment interactions and how they uh, impact birth defects. So I've come quite a, I've veered quite a bit away from uh, that. Um, when I moved to Boulder, I worked at CU with the Institute for Behavioral Genetics. And um, while I was there, I worked a lot on um, substance use and conduct disorder in adolescents and young adults. I studied the three main drugs that I studied were tobacco, alcohol, and marijuana. And I always like to say that when you're looking at the negative aspects of, of the drug, it's marijuana research. And when you're looking at it more agnostically, it's cannabis research. So back then I did marijuana research and now I do cannabis research. Uh, but of course, you really don't want kids using cannabis. It's uh, you know, multiple studies over the years, over the decades have shown that it can impact the growing brain in very negative ways. Um, but, you know, uh, depends on the cannabinoid that you're using. Cannabis is a very complicated plant and the plant itself is made up of many components. The two cannabinoids that are most famous are THC, which is the one that makes you high. And then there's CBD, um, which is uh, anti-inflammatory and is used for things like seizure disorders. And so CBD is often used in adolescents for, for seizure disorders and maybe some other things. But uh, back in the day when I was at CU, the gateway theory was, was pervasive. That is that when you start using cannabis, it leads to heavier drug use. That has since been disproven. Uh, so I worked for, uh, I was there for, I think, about eight years. And so I had uh, a lot of experience working with uh, doing survey stu type studies and also genetic type studies, um, looking at cannabis in that population. Had a hiatus for a while. And after my accident in 2009, um, I was in severe chronic pain. And my husband, uh, at that time, uh, cannabis was legal medically in Colorado. I had a, a qualifying condition, I had neuropathic pain. Uh, but I was just mortified to ask anybody about cannabis because attitudes have changed dramatically over the years. In, in 2009, 2010, 2011, when I was going through a lot of um, trying to figure out what was going on and, you know, trying to understand where the pain was coming from and 
all, all of the things that you go through when you're trying to get a diagnosis. Um, the opioid crisis was at its highest and opioid prescriptions were just given out like candy. And that's what people wanted to put me on. Um, and I was looking for alternatives, but it just never occurred to me that cannabis actually was medicinal. There weren't a lot of studies looking at it more agnostically. Um, you know, it's not going to solve all problems. It's not all good. It's not all bad. It's somewhere in between. And as an epidemiologist, I decided that I wanted to study it in that manner, looking at it in a very neutral way. What are the benefits? What are the harms? Who is it going to help? Who is it going to hurt? What is it good for? What is it not good for? And so I started um, a nonprofit, Canada Research Foundation. We're very small but mighty. And our goal is to do um, high-level research so that we can help unlock the mysteries of cannabis and share that information with anybody who needs it, whether it's physicians, patients, um, stakeholders, uh, manufacturers, um, just get that information out there. So our our goals are kind of two pronged. One is to do the research and the other is to disseminate the information. But let's even take a step back further okay. and let's talk about something called the endocannabinoid system. Yes, and please. you know, the question is, you know, the 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 question being is, well, why does why does cannabis even work in humans? And it's because we have built into our body something called the endocannabinoid system. And so we have receptors in our brain, in our periphery, um uh, cannabinoid receptors, CB1 and CB2. And then we also have molecules that we make that bind to these receptors. And those are called endogenous, meaning that we make them ourselves. And so when we use cannabis, um, THC binds to these receptors that we have naturally in our bodies. And so if you have dysregulation of your endocannabinoid system, the, th the thought is that when you use exogenous, meaning coming from outside your body, taking um, cannabis either in any of its forms, whether you smoke it, vape it, uh, use it as a topical, as a edible, as an oil, in some way that brings that dysregulation back into harmony in some way. Hmm. And because of where these receptors are in the body, um, for example, the CB2 receptor is mostly in the gut, whereas the CB1 receptor is mostly in the brain. THC binds that CB1 receptor, which is why it has a psychoactive um, effects. But the cannabis plant itself, we talk a lot about C THC and CBD. There are over a hundred um, cannabinoids. And so they are starting to um, look at other cannabinoids like CBG and CBN and, and what they do. And then they're now starting to modify them and get Delta-8 THC to try and get around some of these rules um, about Delta-9 THC, which is the one that's federally illegal. And I was just reading about another um, synthetically modified cannabinoid today that they don't know what to do. They just don't know how to regulate these, you know, cannabinoids that are now being, you know, modified synthetically. Um, but the plant is very complex. If you're buying CBD only, I always tell people because it's not regulated in the same way that THC is that buy it from a reputable source and a reputable source means that you go online to that company's website and you look at them and see, are they making unfounded, um, claims about their product? Do they have a certificate of analysis, which means that they have um, had it um, analyzed so that what's on the label is actually what's in the product. And Consumer Labs um, does studies every year to find out what the best products are. And so I recommend people kind of go online if they're using CBD uh, to see which are the more reputable products that are transparent and um, cont you know continually are showing up on Consumer Labs kind of good list and not on their naughty list. Sure. Um, whereas so, THC is regulated by the states and can only be sold in a dispensary and you have to be um, of a certain age to get it. And um, those are tested in, like in Colorado, for example, anything that's sold in a dispensary has to be tested at a state regulated lab for numerous things, for potency, for molds, pesticides, a whole variety of things. If it's inedible, it has to be homogeneity so that you know, if you buy a um, packet of gummies, you want to know that every single gummy has the same amount of THC in it that's on the label. 
So when you buy from a dispensary, it comes with a certificate of analysis and it says on it what's in it. If you're using inhalation methods. Um, you don't, you have no idea what dose you're, you have no idea how many milligrams you're getting because everybody's going to inhale differently. Um, that may change in the future, especially with vaping because dose meter devices are coming out so that you can, um, dial in better how many milligrams of THC you're getting, um, through, through vaping. Uh, fascinating. But again, any, anybody who's under the age of 21 should be consulting with, with a professional before they embark on a cannabis journey. Um, other people that might be at risk from using cannabis are people that have um, a diagnosis of um, psychosis or have a first degree relative with a diagnosis of psychosis because THC can cause psychotic breaks in people. So if you already have the propensity for it, um, you might not want to mess around with that. Um, people are also allergic to cannabis. So if you're allergic to it, um, it might also be something that you might not want to use. If you have asthma, um, you might want to think about your route of administration. Inhalation methods might not be the best. Um, in terms of people who should use it, um, you know, people who want to try it should try it. If they don't fit into those groups of people who shouldn't, uh, the mantra in the world of cannabis is start low, go slow. So, you know, you always want to start at the a, a very low dose. So if you're using, let's say, THC, two and a half milligrams would be considered a low dose. Um, CBD, on the other hand, um, is not very bioavailable, meaning that um, whatever you take in, a lot of it's not absorbed. And so most people are not taking therapeutic doses of CBD. You know, if they're taking five or 10 milligrams of CBD, it's probably not going to do that much. Um, so higher doses are, you know, in the, in clinical trials, they're using much higher doses, but again, people are going to, everybody is so different and people respond differently. Like I don't respond well to CBD. It just doesn't do anything for me. Whereas I respond well to CBD with THC or THC by itself. Um, so I do still recommend, um, talking to a medical professional, um, bud tenders. Those are the people that work behind the counter have very varying degrees of knowledge about cannabis. Um, I've spoken, I have a medical, uh, way back when I was, you know, very anti-medical card because, you know, the stigma that has long gone. I now have a medical card and some of the bud tenders I've spoken to are very knowledgeable and some have really not very much knowledge. So it really is variable. And um, you asked about groups that shouldn't be using cannabis. One is pregnant women. Um, mm. They've done a lot of studies showing that cannabis is not good for pregnant women to use, yet many bud tenders do recommend it for women who are coming in because they've got nausea and other kinds of issues that they're dealing with. And so right, right there is a, a perfect example of the disconnect about what's in the literature and what studies are showing and what's being recommended by people behind the counter. I do know that um, older adults are the fastest growing um, initiators of cannabis use. Um, there's multiple studies coming out uh, about um, use in older adults. Older adults have a lot of pain, uh, anxiety, a, a, you know, a myriad of issues, and they're turning to cannabis because a lot of older adults are on lots of medications and perhaps they want to do away with them or they just aren't working as well as I'd like, and Canvas might just be a good adjunct to what they're using. Um, for myself, ex as an example, um, uh, I have severe pain, and I thought that cannabis was gonna be the panacea, and I'd never have to take another pain pill again in my life, and um, that is not the case, but um, I don't need nearly as much pain medicine as um, other people suffering the same things that I am, I believe because cannabis number one can enhance uh, the efficacy of an opioid. It makes it last longer. And number two, it, it is a pain reliever. And so um, because I do, I microdose it throughout the day, meaning I take small bits of it and I um, combine CBD with THC. So when you put the two together, um, because they're sort of fighting for the same receptor, CBD takes down that high that you get from THC. So if you use that in combination, you get the benefit of the anti-inflammatory effects of CBD, but you also get the benefits of the THC. But when you put them together, you also, if you find that right ratio that works for you and everybody's different, um, you can be functional and not, you know, high.
which when you're working, you certainly don't want to be high. Sure, sure. And it's interesting you bring up older adults because most of my clients happen to be older adults. And uh, that was part of my interest in, in having this conversation with you today. So that's fascinating here that there's a, I don't know the right terminology or the terminology used, but faster adopters uh, of cannabis today. It's yes, and they are. And what uh, we did a study um, several years ago looking at athletes and we had a very big age range. And it was very interesting that most uh, most of the older adults were using CBD, sort mm -hmm. of, I guess, dipping their toe in. Sure. And, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, let's try some CBD, see how that goes. And then, you know, often then moving over to THC. Uh, but it, it uh, is a, it's a powerful plant and can do a lot of things. But uh, for older adults who are using uh, cannabis, um, THC can um, affect your balance, it can affect your thought process. And so that's a group for whom it's very important to get the dosing right so that you don't fall or have impairment that you don't want. And that's why talking to the medical professional, start low, go slow, and you know really dial it in in a manner that's right for you so that you don't uh, encounter issues that you don't want. You don't want to have the ad adverse effects. If people want to get more information, I'll put a link down below, but where would you recommend that they get more information? Um, uh, Leafly has good information. Leafly? Uh, Leafly is a website that has good information. Um, Kenigma has good information. And, um, you know, Google Scholar, if people want to really delve into it deeply and look at research articles, um, even just uh, looking at the abstract or reading the results um, can be very helpful. Um, you know, I just uh, looking online at reputable, uh, rep reputable publications and sources. That's a hard one. Reputable publications and sources. I know in my industry, at least that's uh, it's very hard to distinguish which ones are reputable or not. And if people want to support your organization and Cannel Research Foundation, I'll include a link below as well for people to support and donate if they'd like. Uh, but do you have research and findings on your website as well? Um, we do have some research finding on our website. Uh, I'm hoping at some point to put together some educational materials uh, on the website uh, so that, you know, people have a place to go to get what they want, or at least putting links to other sites that have uh, good information. So it's a, a work in progress. Fantastic. It always is. But Joanna, thank you for your time, your knowledge, and uh, and sharing with everyone today. Is there anything else that, that we missed that you'd like to just share before we sign off today? I don't think so. I don't know if people write in questions to you or not, but if you get, uh, if people want to write in some questions and uh, there are things that we didn't cover that people seem very interested in, uh, happy to come back and talk about those things. Fantastic. Well, I can provide again your contact information or your website if people want to reach out to you directly, if that'd be okay. Sure thing. All right, John. Thank you again for your time. This was fabulous. Look forward to doing it again. Me too. All right. Take care.